Uh, Isaiah 9, 6. And the word of God says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. Now, this short passage of scripture is so potent and powerful because it really describes who Jesus really is. Now, this culture subliminally and intentionally fights the identity of Christ. The greatest assault on the kingdom of darkness was what John says, the light pierced the darkness. You can read it in the first chapter of John about the light piercing the darkness. At one time in my life, I had not just memorized it in English, but I had memorized it in the original language about Jesus being that light. And the, the Bible says that the darkness tried to hold it down, tried to cover it. But you know what? The thing about darkness is that the closer it gets to light, the more it dissipates. The more, the, you know, the thing is, you know, Christians say, you know, God is just really struggling with the devil. No, he's not. Praise God. Because God is light. And the kingdom of this world and the kingdom of darkness of Satan cannot handle the light. Mm -hmm. uh, that's why, that's why in the beginning of, of, of the faith, People were constantly trying to kill Christians because of the light. And the thing that blew them away, the more, Christian, more Christians they killed, the brighter the light got. You know, I mean, the Christian was shining bright all of a sudden, and then when they made him a martyr, the, the light just blew up all over the place. People said, they must have really been saved to be willing to do that. You know, and so the testimony, even going out when they, you know, going out in a blaze, that's how, you know, that's how believers are supposed to go out and not, not in a fizzle, but in a blaze. Hallelujah. Now, the scripture starts out and says, for unto us, a child is born. Now, this was the greatest strategy that only God could think about that. You really think about that. If you're going to get, um, uh, your agent into the world, and let's just put it, or operative into the, into, and you're fighting a war, you know, usually you come in with great force, but God slips in a baby, an innocent baby, you know. Now, Herod the Great, it blew him away because he was a perfect antitype of who Christ is. Herod had set himself up as being the king and over God's people, sitting on the throne that belonged to God. And in, in a sense, that's an uh, antithesis of what's happening in the world today. We have a culture that says, you know, our kingdom is the kingdom. And so instead of Christ being there, we kind of erase Christ and we bring in our own agenda. And so this is what Herod had done. And when Herod finds out the plot or the plan that God had slipped in a baby. Now here's a guy that was a king over a nation and he's freaked out over a baby. He's, he's, he's like, listen, get the army, get the navy, 
you know, get some spears. Get, I mean, I, I imagine that today, you know, if Herod was living today, get the Army, get the Navy, get the Air Force, get the Space Force, get all the force, kill the baby. Man, this guy was ruthless. You know, the thing about Herod, he had been married nine times. Maybe more, but at least according to history, he had been married nine times. And each one of those times that he had gotten married, they were marriages of convenience, marriages of to get him more power. Uh, that's how they did it back then. You know, they would marry you and that give me more authority over your father's kingdom. And, and so, you know, and the thing was is that I think he... Um, killed nine women too, nine wives. They didn't, you know, you know, they didn't last long because uh, he had an agenda. So this was a very wicked man. And so this wicked man was going after Jesus. So what's the big deal about a baby? As we talked about on last week, he went throughout all of Bethlehem and all throughout that area and he killed every male child up uh, to two years old that was born under the sign of the star that was brought into existence. And so we have the false king and we have the introduction of the real king. Now the strategy of God, which always blows me away. First of all, you look at some of the things that God did. First of all, instead of Jesus being born in majesty and, you know, in purple robes and, and trumpets and, and angels walking down the aisles, he was born in a manger in a place that was unsanitary, unclean. It wasn't like your Christmas card where that was all glowy and sparkly and, and everything was pristine and clean. Um, here we have the king of the world born in this filthy place. I mean, it was a filthy place. And, and not to be crude, but poop was all around. You know, I mean, when you want to have a baby, you want things to be as clean and as sanitary as possible. You know, but here Christ is born probably on a robe on some straw that the cattle had just been eating on. You know, here he comes into existence, no midwife, no anything, just Joseph. And how many know that um, if men had to deliver babies, they would probably just faint and it, I mean, it would be like, you got, um, you know, you got to be kidding me. Boom, he's out, you know, you know, you know, he'll wake up when it's all over with, you know. So, so, uh, so here, here we go. Inexperienced Joseph, you know, trying to deliver this baby. Mary looking at Adam and saying, Lord, I know I want to be in your will, but I didn't know it was going to be like this. You know, sometimes to be in God's will, it's, it's tough. It doesn't look glamorous. It doesn't look cool. It doesn't feel cool. It, sometimes it feels all wrong. Just think about this. An angel comes to you and says, you're going to have this child, and this child is going to change everything because it's the Messiah. And, and being the mother of the Messiah was the dream of every young woman that uh, was in Israel. Everybody wanted to be the mother. That was the highest honor that could be given, is that I get to be the mother of the Messiah. And that's why when the angel said to Mary, you are highly favored. You are highly favored. And then the angel tells her, and she, she says, oh man, this is gonna, you know, I, I don't know, I've never been with a man. And she, the, the Gabriel says, don't worry about it. God's got it figured out. Just know you're gonna end up pregnant. Now that's a mind-blowing thing right there. You know, here you are a virgin, but now you're told that, you know, you're gonna, you're gonna get pregnant tonight, but there's not gonna be anybody there. You're gonna be overpowered by the Holy Spirit, and you're gonna be implanted by literally the presence of God is going to cause you. God himself is going to get into your womb. Now that's a deep story. That's, 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 you know, and so 
And so it happens. And so just think, you have to go and tell your fiance, you're, you're betrothed, uh, honey, we're still gonna get married, I'm pregnant. And he says, what? <laughs> And he said, don't worry about it. It's by the Holy Ghost. Yeah, right. The Holy Ghost. You tell me that you got impregnated by the Holy Ghost. Well, well, you know, all kinds of thoughts probably went through his head. But, you know, God had to come to him. And, and rightfully so, because most of you guys understand that only God... You know, like some people, the Holy Ghost will have to tell me himself, you know, <laughs> amen. And the Lord does re reveal himself in a dream to him and convinces him that this is, this is, this is me. Don't worry about it. You know, this is, this is me. Now, the scripture says in uh, Isaiah 9, 6, for unto us a child is born, a son is given. And the government will be upon his shoulder, and his name will be called Wonderful. Now, the great fear of this culture is that Jesus takes over. Right now, in this culture, Christian thought, Christian way of being, the lifestyle of a Christian, what the Bible says uh, uh, life is all about in him, is fought against. It's fought by secular humanists that say that uh, there is no God. Many of them are just atheists and there is no God and we, and we don't need God. Man is the sum total of all things. You know, it's our own intellect, our own ability. It's what we do ourselves. It's what we make ourselves. There's no supernatural being up there that cares about us individually, but it's what we make of it. Life is uh, existential. It's what we bring out of it. It's what, it's what we believe it to be. That's why the culture says weird things like we all have our own truth. You have your truth. I have my truth. We all have, and all these truths are are equal, but you, we all know that doesn't work. Praise God. Don't marry somebody that that has a different truth than you have. Yeah. That's why we have so many divorces. The wife has her truth. And the husband has his truth, and they all have their truth. And, and so your children have their truth. I'm sorry, Mom, but I don't see it like you see it. My truth is that I like my room messy. That's my truth, you know. I like my drawers all over the place. I like, you know, I, I just like it, you know, bed unmade up. Just that's my truth. Like I'm living like I want to live. Let me live the way that you, you know, it's my room. Just shut the door when you pass and pretend like it's not there because it's my truth. People have messy lives. If you ever raise children, you know what I'm talking about. Amen. And, 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 uh, and you know, when you're growing up, you have to get it through to them that, you know what? The only truth that's in this house is my truth. Until you move out into your truth, under this roof, you in my truth. <laughs> you know, I, I, in God, it's God's world. It's his truth. It's not what you make up to be your truth. The Bible says that the government would be upon his shoulder. What, is, what does that mean? It means that the ultimate authority is going to finally end up in Jesus' hands, in his, in his authority, in his purview, what he wants. This was a great threat to Satan. This was a great threat to Satan because he knew that this was something coming that he never saw coming. Because when he sealed the deal with Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, and they gave him the title of this world and the kingdoms of this world, that's why he said to Jesus, when Jesus was on that fast, it's all been given to me. The title of this world, it's been given to me, it belongs to me. And you can't, you know, you know how can you get it back? But 
Satan knew that Jesus could take it back because God had sent him. You know, the amazing thing about Jesus, he's the only one that I know that's come into this world just to die. Hmm. Why was he here? He came to die. Most of us, we come, I came to live. But you talk to Jesus, I came to die. Because, why? Because it's God's will. It's God's way. It's what? It's going to be able to pay the price for humanity. I'm the sinless Savior that can only pay for the sins of the world. Religion tells us, religion tells us that if we're good enough, if we're perfect enough, if we don't break any commandments, if we do everything the right way every day, if we, if we say our prayers and we pray a long time, God is going to give us favor. If we do good deeds, if we have, you know, just go about being a do gooder that's going to get us points with God and so people will come to me and to most of us and say well I'm a good person but you see the thing is to God the, the, you know Jesus said this he says there's not one good no not one see a lot of people they think well if I'm a really good person that means that God must really like me it has nothing to do with you being a good person None of us, no matter how good we are, is good enough. You might say, well, I know I'm better than that person. You know, that's the thing that really gets me is that, you know, good people usually become prideful people, especially when you think you're a good person. Because think about the statement what you mean when you say, I'm a good person. What are you comparing that to? To other people that you've seen. I'm a good person. You know, am I not a good person? Well, gooder than who? I always say, what makes you a good? What are you comparing that with? Well, at least I'm not like my neighbors next door. You know, they party all the time, you know, and have strange men in there. And they got an open marriage. And man, I'm not like that. Yeah, well, I'm not like him. He's a drug addict. You know? He's lived a sordid life. Oh, I'm not like her because she's kind of loose. You know, she just, you know, just kind of, you know. What God says is that no matter how good you think you are, you're no better than anybody else. You know, that's one of the, that's one of the great lessons that I learned is that just because you might have degrees and titles and, and, uh, and prominence and you may have uh, a certain significance in culture and society, when it all comes down to it, at the end of the day, you're a sinner. And without Jesus Christ, without Jesus Christ paying the price for your souls, your destiny is the same place as a rapist or any vile person that's done evil things to other people and cursed the face of God. Your destiny is the same place with that person. You know, the thing is, is that being a Christian should not make us feel better than anybody else. It should humble us in the sense that we know that without Jesus Christ, there goes I. That, you know, that's why as a believer, you know, we should be able to be able to get down in the dirt with people when they fall into their lowest. It should not be hard for us to get down there with them because we know that without God, that's who we are also. You see, the thing is, is that, that sin is not just something that you do. S being sinful is something that you are. Yeah. All have been born in sin and come short of the glory of God. You know, one of the sad things that the church has done to the world is make people feel bad and, and guilty about themselves. You know, that somehow us church folks are better than you world folks. The difference between us church folks and new world folks is that we have been washed by the blood of the lamb. Jesus has declared us righteous. Listen, my righteousness is not of my own account. I can't say that I deserve to go to heaven. I can't say that. Praise God. But, hallelujah. But Jesus died for my sins. And so this was the great, this was the great, solution solved about sin Jesus coming into this world and so for us to get the deed and the right 
of salvation back together from God came through this baby. And the Bible says that the upon his shoulder, the government would be on his shoulder. It's a time that Jesus is going to take over. A lot of times people say, well, you know, meek and mild Jesus. Yes, he is meek and mild, but the Bible says that the next time he comes, he's coming on a white horse. And the saints are going to be with him, and the army is going to be with him. Praise God. Listen, I, I like to tell folks, I said, the next time you see me, I'm going to be coming with Jesus, and I'm going to be wearing my shield. You know, I'm, we, you know, I, Chamia came in talking about the movie 300. That's how, that's how the saints are coming back. That's how we're, we're, kind of, we're coming back on that level. Jesus says that that's the way that he's coming back. Amen. Are y'all with me? Praise God. The Bible says that one of the names of Jesus is wonderful. Now you think about that. For someone or something to be wonderful, it causes you to wonder. You know, so what, you know, to wonder, I mean, that's one thing that I, I love as a child, I was one of the kids that, that was in awe and wonder of just being alive. Now, I can remember the first time I seen a butterfly. You know, and this was one of those giant monarch butterflies. And uh, somehow it got in the house. And I looked up and there's this thing that had big purple and yellow, I mean purple f f moving into yellow and orange and all of these colors and it was not a small one, it was a huge. And I looked up and I was like, oh, whoa, what is that? My mother said, it's a butterfly. And I said, wow, and it was flying through the house and it was trying to get out of the house and so my mother got ahead of it and opened the screen door and it ran, I mean, I ran through the screen door following the butterfly trying to catch it because I didn't want it to get away. It was, I didn't want to kill it. It was so beautiful. I just wanted to look at it a little bit longer. I was in wonder. Now, I mean, I was pretty young. I was maybe three and a half years old or so. And that's another problem I have is that I have this memory that holds things forever. But anyway, it was an incredible time of wonder for me. Um, just, just being alive. I mean, I was in awe of just about every, I was in awe of eggs. Isn't that weird? You know, I was, I was like, man, you know, wow, you, you crack this little package open and you, you put it in a skillet. I mean, it's a li I mean, it was like a package, you know, you crack this little package open and, uh, and, 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 and you tell me chickens make these, whoa, you know, and, and then you crack it in a skillet and you, and your mom stirs it and man, you got scrambled eggs. Whoa. I mean, I was like that. Whoa. Oh, man, this is, you know, this world, it's incredible. Now, that's my experience of being alive. I was always in wonder. I mean, I mean, I would look up at the sky and I'd just be looking. He would say, little boy, are you okay? It's so blue. Wow. Look at those clouds. I mean, I was like. I guess the ultimate daydreamer, but it was not just a daydreamer. It was like wonder. It was just, you know, and we should never lose that. But you know, when you meet Jesus, that should be the most wonderful experience of your life. I am still in awe of Jesus. I am still in awe of Jesus. So most people say, well, you know, why do you like going to church? Well, it's not for me like having to go to church because, see, church leaves with me all the time. I'm always at church. 
I'm always, I'm always at church. I don't know about you, you know. That used to bother my employers because I'd go to work and I'd still be at church. I, I did my job, but they knew that I, I was at church. I, I, sometimes I would turn on my little radio and it'd be church songs on. It'd be the word of God coming through. And some of them get angry and says, can't you play anything else? Can't you put anything else in there? Well, I'm still in wonder of God. I want to ask you this question today. Does God still bring you wonder? Does the Lord still bring you wonder? When you reflect on him, when you think about him, does he still bring you? You know, when the Lord gives you wonder, you know, and you're overtaken by him, that everything else is in a shadow because of his presence and his light in your life. So it says he shall be wonderful. That should be your, your experience is that you are always as a believer in wonder. Now, one of the sad things that happens to Christians, and you'll find this in the book of Revelation in one of the seven churches that had lost their first, first love, the wonder, the wonder of their first love. Um, I, I think this probably identifies more with young ladies than sometimes young men because our motives are different. <laughs> see, <laughs> oh, praise. See, uh, see, you got y'all looking at me like what? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, young young girls, you you have probably a better grip on reality, and that's the only reason that a lot of times men can, or young men can, kind of mess with you because your mind is finding that ultimate wonderful person, that person that you like being with, that that person that makes you feel good, that has your best interests at heart, and you, you become overtaken by that, just the feeling of thinking that maybe this might be the one, even though you might be really be young, and that's when you're really vulnerable, because you think you're going to find that right away. Am I telling the truth? You know, uh, you know, now the guy is thinking, you know, I'll get this, tap that, and I'm down the road. And <laughs> see, y'all looking at me like. <laughs> see, see, y'all looking at me like, huh? Yeah. See, okay. yeah, shame the devil. Said, Amen. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so. <laughs> But you know, the thing is, is this, is that reality hits and you find out that that person that you thought was so wonderful, they, they, they weren't. Yeah. They, 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 they were not wonderful. They didn't really care about you. You know, the relationship, it, it was not even an infatuation. It was a deception. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Praise God. Yeah. But we have, we have Jesus Christ, who is absolutely wonderful. And when we step in his presence, his presence means more than anything else. Amen. All right. Praise God. And then the Bible tells us that he's a counselor. Now, the thing is, the ultimate therapist, you know, the word therapist come, comes from the Greek word therapeuo, which means to heal. And so when you go to somebody as a therapist, you're going to somebody that's going to help heal your mind, you know. And so we'll go and get therapy. And I'm not against therapy, but I don't want us to forget that the greatest therapist is Jesus. Amen. Putting yourself in the counsel of the Lord. Many times we'll solve, but I would say every time we'll solve the issues, the deep seated issues of your mind. I'm not saying stop going to your therapist, but I'm saying the great therapist. And that's what the Bible says here with a wonderful counselor, the great therapist is Jesus. Spending time in the presence of the Lord will take away your mental anguish, the things that have troubled your soul, your spirit, your mind, the things that are, that are eating you up from the inside, the way to 
get free is to spend time in the presence of the Lord. You know, it's not easy being alive, especially in this culture, in this world, and the way that we have to work today. Now, now I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you, if you got a job, you're under pressure. Because they want to squeeze everything out of you that they can get. Listen, you are the disposable commodity. You're like a milk carton. When the milk is gone, crush the carton, throw it away, get another carton of milk. You are the container of what they want. And when they feel that, and I know this sounds terrible to say this, when they feel like there's nothing left in the container, they're just looking for another container. You, you understand what I'm saying? And so you can be put under a lot of pressure, a lot of stress today to perform because you know that if they think the container is empty, Come on, y'all. Y'all know what I'm talking about. Amen. You know, if they think the container's empty or the, or the container's not giving them what they want, guess what? It's gone. That's, you know, and that's a lot of pressure to be under because you have to perform. You see, the world demands that we perform. But in God, we don't have to perform. We just have to be. Praise God. He will counsel us. He will ease the troubles of our minds. Listen to me. You need to know this. This is who Jesus is. He will counsel you in your spirit. He will reach you where no one else can reach you. And he will give you answers that no one else can because he's the wonderful counselor. You see, this life can really be hard. You marry somebody and you think it's going to be a great life, but you find out you're married to a monster. And that's man and woman. You know, and you find like, oh, this, this thing is supposed to be so great. It turns out not to be so great. Sometimes it turns out to be painful, you know. And... I know somebody said, well, don't worry about it. Jesus will fix it. Well, Jesus fixes things in our lives, but he's not going to force anybody to change. And so you may end up being with somebody that's not going to change. That's just, just who they're going to be. I've told this story several times, but I know this preacher. He was a great preacher, great man of God, great musician, great singer, you know, but he was married to Eva Dale. And, and that was literally her name, Eva Dale, but we all took the A out and put an I in there. It was Evil Dale. And she was, she was nothing nice to be with. Even, she didn't even allow prayer in his house. In order for him to have prayer and Bible study, he'd have to go out in Minnesota, sit in his car, and read his Bible and pray because if he prayed in the house that meant it was going to be a fight and an argument because she hated God. She hated God. You think you got it bad. This brother, you know, he's the only, he's the only brother that when he passed away everybody rejoiced. Thank you Jesus, he's free. Hallelujah. Thank God. Amen. Free at last. Free at last. Thank God he's free. I mean, that's how I mean, that's how we felt. I mean, when this man passed away, we were like, thank you, Jesus, he's free. So, I mean, that, was, that was really, I mean, I'm telling the truth. That was how bad the situation was. But even, you know, the thing that blew us all away is that, you know, he was still determined to serve the Lord. He said, he said you know, I don't care how bad it gets. He says, I'm going to serve Jesus. Right. I'm going to do what the Lord says. You see, we, will, we think that because we become believers that we're going to all, everything's going to be soft in life. Sometimes you become a believer, praise God, it could cost your life. Yeah. Amen. I, I mean, we used to sing a song years ago. This is an old song, so I'm not going to try to sing because I can't sing. But one of the verses in the song, I'm going to live for it if it costs my life. Yeah. And the thing is, is this, it may cost your life. Yeah. It's going to cost your life on some level. Yeah. Praise God. Jesus said this, that when you embrace me, it's going to make some people go away. 
It's going to make some people go away. Listen, when I got saved, people left me so quick, I thought their tennis shoes caught on fire. I mean, it was like, what happened? I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, I had my entourage. I mean, not that I was so popular, but kids just seemed to just gravitate towards me until I just had a gathering of young people. I never called myself the leader, but I, I guess I was. You know, I didn't try to be, you know. But when Jesus came into my life, man, I, I, I looked up one day and I was all by myself. You know, all by myself. You know, nobody wanted to come over and sit and talk and have fun anymore. No, nope. I'm sorry, can't make it. You know, and it stayed that way. <laughs> all right. Are y'all still with me? Yes, the Bible says he's a mighty God. His name is Mighty God. Who is Jesus? He's God. Jesus is God. See, this is what blew, this is what blew Satan away, is that he couldn't believe that God will actually bring himself into the picture in that way. You know, so Satan knew that I'm up against God himself. There's just no way that I'm going to win this thing. We got Jesus, the God man. So in Jesus, the God man, not part God and not part man, but entirely God and entirely man. He's entirely God representing the kingdom of God and entirely man representing all of humanity. Yes. And the sacrifice of this God man would s separate man from sin. And God would get his man back again. Religion tells us that we can do it ourselves. But there was only one person that could bear the sins of the world, and that was Jesus. Jesus. God, man, everlasting Father. I think about this. As wonderful as it is to have a father, everybody doesn't get a father. You might say, yeah, but you, you, you know, they had to get here somehow. Just because you produce a baby does not mean you're a father. You might even be at home with them. That don't mean you're a father. You know, even your presence doesn't bring fatherhood. But we find that Jesus is the perfect representation of the everlasting father, prince of peace. I don't know about you, but I've lived long enough to know that sometimes things in life go radically wrong, absolutely wrong, unimaginably wrong. I remember I was in joy. I was going to have a daughter. My daughter was born. I was so happy. I looked in the face of that little girl and said, girl, you're getting ready to have the best life you ever had. You listen, you're going to have Cadillacs. You're going to, you listen, listen, I'm, you know, I just can't hardly wait to spoil you, you know, because uh, that's how fathers are with, I mean, they, they love their sons, but there's something about that daughter that she becomes the, the apple of his eye. And, I, and, and, and so my little girl, man, I looked at her, man, girl, you getting ready to have a good ride. Woo! You know? And then a week later, she passes away. To me, that was unimaginable. That was unimaginable. I remember having to pick out her little casket and, and put all that together. I mean, I was just broken, you know, picking out the little casket and then the, in the box that the casket goes into and, and then the concrete that they put in the ground. And, I mean, I was like, you know, I was like a zombie. I was so like, whoa, you know. And you might say, well, how did it affect you so sanctified? Listen, I was broken. I was broken. Praise God. And only, only the Lord could bring me peace. You know, people would come, well, you can, you can always have more children. And I was like, even having more doesn't really make it up in my mind. But what about this one? 
And there are things that happen to us in our lives, things that happen to us in our lives that are, that are, are the, the worst. The worst. And you know what that worst is that happened to us. But only God, only, only the, the wonderful counselor, only the prince of peace can bring us peace. No words from anyone can bring us peace. Only the counsel and the presence of God in our lives can give us peace and get us through the mess that we're going through. And that's who Jesus is. He is the prince of peace. I'm amazed at people. I'm amazed that people feel like, well, I don't need no, no God in my life. I don't need no Lord in my life. I don't need nothing like that. Get that religion away from me. We're not bringing religion to you. We're bringing a relationship with God to you. A Lord that will love you. Listen, as much as I love my wife that I've been married to for almost 60 years, nobody can love me like Jesus nobody can love me like Jesus hallelujah nobody can love me like Jesus that's why if you're a believer and everything in this world is taken from you and you have nothing you still got everything because you got Jesus you see, and, 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 and if you're not saved you can't understand that don't tell me oh I can understand no you can't understand it because you can't understand it until you know him and when you know him, then you'll know what I'm talking about. Amen. Praise God. All right. The scripture says that I'm ending. Uh, of his, in, of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. The thing is, is this, is that being in Jesus Christ is everlasting life. And this is what Christmas is all about. I thank God for the jingle bells. I thank God for Santa Claus. I thank God for all the little toys that we still get. But the thing is, is the big gift that we've got is Jesus. Jesus is, thank you. Thank you, brother. He's help, he's hasn't been in church, but he helped me preach today. Thank you, brother. Amen. Amen. And so this morning, as, as we continue into the Christmas season, let us reflect on who Christ is in our life because every day for a believer is Christmas. Amen. Every, every day is Christmas. Praise God. Thank you. Every day is Christmas. Praise God. Well, I didn't get there and I wanted it. You didn't have a bow on it. Praise God. Get real. <laughs> you know? Uh, get, get, get real. Praise God. <laughs> I always say, you know, when you get to be a person of a certain age, you know, you pretty much get everything you want because you're going to get it for yourself anyway. Now, 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 see y'all looking at me like, what? You know, what? Praise. Yeah, you know, I, said, I, I, I tell people, I said, if I want it bad enough, I'm going to get it. It's going to, I mean, it's not like, oh, I might, no, it's going to happen. Pastor Gail will tell you, because this is, this is, this has been my nature always, because when we married her, you know, Pastor Gail came up in a different situation than I did, and, you know, of, of self-sacrifice and things like that because of the difficulties of her family, but I didn't come up self-sacrificing, you know. Um, my father was on, and I thank God for my dad. Because he told me, he said, for you to receive something good, you don't have to deserve it. Now, let that sit, settle in your mind. Let that settle in your mind. He would tell me, he said, he said I, I'm going to bless you just because you my son and I love you. He said, I'm not giving you stuff because you've been particularly good or bad because, boy, sometimes you's really bad. <laughs> I mean, I remember as a, as a teenager, I came out, and there was this beautiful blue Triumph TR3, four on the floor, black wheels, white top, just powder blue, 
pure, deep, dark blue leather seats, you know, chrome, spoke wheels, I mean, bad for days. I looked out and I said, oh, that's a bad for days car out there, Dad. He says, yeah, here's the keys, it's yours. Oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> Woo -hoo! Woo -hoo! I couldn't even drive. <laughs> <laughs> but I got in and drove away. <laughs> I, know, <that's> right. <laughs> I had just got my license. And I figured it. That's right. I figured it out. <laughs> and where was I on my way to? To Gail Jean Cotton. <laughs> Gail Jean Cotton. I rolled up, you know. I mean, I mean, I, it was a stick shift. I mean, I, I could, and so, you know, when you don't do it right, the thing go pow, you know. I rolled up, you pow, pow. <laughs> it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> Woo -hoo. You know, I got out and I said, Gail, get out here. She out there and said, This is our car. We weren't even mad. <laughs> Man, she got into it, and I couldn't tell forward from reverse. I hit it, hit the reverse, and hit the accelerator. I didn't know it was going to go in reverse, and ran into the back of her garage. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh Lord. Yeah. I looked at her and said, That's okay. I said, I can buy some new taillights. Yeah. <laughs> they, you know, it wasn't serious damage. Yeah. But, but she looked at me, half scared and laughing at the same time, and says, we're going for a ride. I said, we're going, baby. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Lord Jesus. But you know what? I mean, that, 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 was, that was my father. It, wasn't, it, was, it was just because. That's the kind of daddy we have in the Lord. Yeah. You know? He's going to bless us just because. Now, getting down to ourselves, sometimes, you know, I'll bless myself just because. I don't have to sit around and say, well, I don't know if I should buy this because I don't deserve this. I'll look at myself in the mirror and say, I don't care if I deserve it or not. That's what I'm getting. <laughs> this is what we're getting. <laughs> you know, I'm not, I'm not going to have no guilt trip from getting this. <laughs> Do y'all understand what I'm saying? See, oh, yeah. see, we put ourselves through mess, you know? You know? You don't have to deserve to get your hair done. Woman. <laughs> go ahead and pay that. Well, I know how much it is. Go ahead and pay that $150 and go. <laughs> I think I'm at least close, ain't I? You know, go ahead and get it done. Yeah. Amen. And you're going to feel a lot worse than you look in the mirror and all napped up and stuff like that. You, that'll put a guilt trip on you. <laughs> and everybody else around you, too. <laughs> you know, girl, I need to help you get your hug done. <laughs> you know? Okay. I'm, uh, all right. I'm, I'm, uh, Lord, I'm not messing around there. Okay. I want to say that Christmas is a time that we can rejoice and enjoy the Lord. Amen. and walk in him in freedom and liberty and understand that we are saved to this day. You know, you, the, the gift of righteousness, I'm, I'm going to end it with this gift of righteousness. The Apostle Paul, you need to especially read Ephesians and, and, you know, and, and Romans. And the Bible says that we've been declared righteous. What does that mean? It means that all the goodness that Jesus is and the way that God sees Jesus is Jesus gives that to us. Amen. That's the gift. See, even many of us that are Christians, we sit around and we count our faults and all our failures and, and think about, well, I could have did this better and, and I could have done that. You listen, you're on the devil's side when you do that. But the Bible says that the devil is the accuser of a brother and sister. How many understand what I got, just got into? Amen. Here you are saved, filled with the Holy Spirit, been forgiven of all your sins, past, present, and future. And you sitting around talking about how that you're not worthy. He made you worthy. If the Holy Spirit comes to you and convicts you, then you need to listen to the Holy Spirit. I'm going to tell you something. If you are truly saved, you will not be happy living out of the counsel and the presence of God. And you will not be happy with sin in your life. 
How many hear what I'm saying? Amen. Praise God. All right, I'm done. Father, we thank you for today. We thank you for the gift of salvation through Jesus Christ. That baby that you sent that became the sacrifice for our sins. Lord, we thank you because we rejoice of what you have given us. Father, we've given you joy. You've given us joy. And you said, Lord, because of your joy, the zeal of the Lord has done this thing. Father, it's because you really wanted to. You loved us so much. It was your zeal. It was your passion to see us saved. Father, I thank you, Lord God, that you have, you have saved us. Father God, and we may not be perfect, but you have saved us. And Father, we rejoice in your presence in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to our study of the Gospel of John. I have fallen in love with the work of Paul as I've studied the book of 1 Corinthians, and I believe you will too. This is where Jesus taught in Capernaum, and you have to understand this scene. The Lord is my shepherd. And over the next six weeks, we're going to look deeply into the 23rd Psalm. Right now, media, it's for groups. It's for personal devotion. It's for parents. The bullseye of parenting is to raise children who become like Jesus. It's for kids. This is Phil. We're digging into the Bible, which, as we've mentioned, is more than just a book. It's for tough times. So when you recognize that you're trying to have a conversation with your spouse and they're not ready to talk, it's not helpful to keep pressing right. them. It's for every phase of life. If you've made mistakes with money, you know what that makes you? Over 12. And now, it's yours. We've purchased a Right Now Media subscription for everyone in our church. So check your inbox for the digital invitation and download the app for instant access to thousands of biblically-based videos. Get equipped. Get inspired. Staying connected to your friends, family, and small group has never been easier. Introducing the Right Now Media Groups feature. 
Now you can watch Bible studies together and discuss the content in real time using the built-in video chat function. It's easy to participate in a Bible study without ever leaving your home. Simply choose a Bible study session from the Right Now Media Library on your desktop or mobile browser and click Watch as a Virtual Group. Share the group link with other Right Now Media users, then start your group. Once everyone is in, click Start the Video to begin playing the session for your group. With the Right Now Media Groups feature, you can learn, encourage one another, and grow in your faith, even when you can't be physically together. Learn more at rightnowmedia.org groups and start your first virtual group today.